Hey, it's Kev here, and I think you're really going to dig today's episode with Ian Stanley, one of the funniest guys and brightest copywriters I've met in a long time. Just a quick heads up, this episode, uh, we usually try to keep it pretty clean here on The Truth About Marketing, but this episode goes down some uh, raunchier paths. So if you got sensitive ears uh, in the car with you, or um, if you're just opposed to things like that, then you might want to skip this one. Otherwise, sit back, enjoy, get ready to laugh and learn a lot from Ian Stanley. You hear all the bull about marketing every day. Make your money in your sleep. My new offer is crushing it. My guru could beat up your guru. It's time to go right to the source and get the truth about marketing. With your host, the founder of CopyChief.com, Kevin Rogers. Hey, welcome back to The Truth About Marketing. It's Kevin Rogers here. I'm your host, and this is the show where I interview uh, people that I find interesting and that have uh, done real stuff with marketing. You know, this is not just hype or theory. Uh, we get to talk directly to the people who are out making it happen in their businesses, and they tell us the stuff they did that they might not have expected to work, but then worked even twice as good as they would have expected if they did expect it to work. So today, I'm really pleased and excited to welcome uh, my buddy, Ian Stanley, to the show. Ian is a copywriter first, but uh, his career has been so ridiculously off the charts, explosive in the last three months that I don't even know if, I don't think copywriter quite sums it up anymore. But Ian's going to talk to us about his his recent journey. The man's only 26 years old as we record this. And, uh, but, you know, has tremendous wisdom and uh, it has accomplished a lot, a lot in business in, in just a few years uh, of doing it. So, Ian, thanks for coming on, brother. Make it time for us today. Thank you for having me. I've been looking forward to this for so long. Thank you for saying my age. You gave away the punchline that's supposed to be the final. Oh, really? The final. They, they, people are sitting there listening going, this guy has to be in his 70s. Sure. Listen to that voice. <laughs> it's so robust and manly sounding. <laughs> so, Ian, you and I bonded immediately uh, over a few things, primarily that uh, you are also, or at least have also performed stand-up comedy. Uh, you consider it a passion, and I will be the first to say out loud, uh, you are truly one of the funniest people I've met. You, you just have that thing where, uh, you know what I love about hanging with you, bro? And I'll, I'll just start out with the ass kissing right away. It, <laughs> is that you, you at any moment could take over the room and, and often do and, and put everybody in stitches. But it's not like this need you have for constant attention, which is usually the thing where I check out of somebody after like an hour and go, OK, I'm done with that guy. <laughs> I uh, I like appreciate babysitter. you. Yeah, so so I, that. but it's a uh, it's a weird blend. <laughs> have you you're secure with yourself, man? And so have you always been funny? Uh, you know, growing up, were you the guy, was your mom calling you in the room to do the the latest bit? Oh God, no! My mom was my mom was cheering against me to lose in whatever sport I was playing at the moment. That <laughs> uh, <laughs> definitely. You know, it's, it's funny you say that, and it's it's such a weird thing when people say, like, especially a girl, but, oh, my God, you're so you're so funny. You're so funny. And it's like, what do you want me to say to that? Right. Like, thank you? So Jesse Elder has helped me say thank you to people and learn how to accept compliments. Um, I do doubt your uh, saneness because kissing my ass is one of the hairiest experiences you can find yourself <laughs> in. Um, but, no, I, I really appreciate you saying that because it is one of those weird – um, sort of lines of, of really just enjoying, you know, at Carlton, you know, when we were at Carlton's thing, he was really the one who, who told me about empaths and, and that gave me a big insight into why I enjoy making people laugh so much because I just experience their joy when they're that happy. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the one thing that I've been lucky enough to be able to notice, and maybe it is that empath side, is a lot of people who are funny will go at any length for the joke and they'll put everything above 
you know, they'll put the laugh yeah. above everything else. Right, and there right. are times when I'm like, God, that's a good joke. And I'm like, it's not the right time. Mm. Or, and so that sort of towing that line, especially at like masterminds and stuff where it's like, it's fun to, to, to have laughter and make it a fun room. Right, but right. then at the same time, know that there's like, no, this is a serious thing. Like let that thing slide and, and just <laughs> sort of be serious for, it, it's also sort of, I, it's like a 95, five thing for me where 95% of the time I mess around and joking. And so I find that oddly people appreciate those, those few moments when I'm serious, they're like, mm. huh, <laughs> I didn't know you had that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it's funny how you, you quickly, you can tell how much somebody sort of gets it in, in life and understands people. The quickest way to show that you, you're, you're somebody who really doesn't get it is when you meet a comedian and, and immediately say something like, Oh, okay. Make me laugh. Or, or, Oh man, you should, you should come to my work and you'd have a whole new skit. You know, people, oh pe people who just think that uh, it's, you know, it, you're, you're like a jukebox. If you're and you're constantly looking for material, that that's your whole life. I'll uh, tell you what, if you came down and hung out with my buddy Ted, you'd have a full twenty minutes you could talk about him for you, the funniest damn person I ever did meet. <laughs> and you're like, How did I get in a conversation with a guy that's this much of a hick? But you know. <laughs> so uh that's great. Um let's talk about comedy. A couple things you did. Uh and again, you know, look, uh People ask me, for obvious reasons, a lot whether they should use humor in their sales copy. And my immediate answer, 99% of the time, is no. Don't do it. Because uh, it's just, it's it's always safer not to. Always. Um, you're one of the few people who I've seen use humor to great effect. And really get the right kind of attention with it. Um, a couple of instances, I want to talk about, uh, well, you did a really funny video where you gave a, a presentation, uh, about giving just the tip <laughs> and it's <laughs> slowly revealed that, that you're, uh, you know, drawing a giant penis. Uh, but the funny part is that you never acknowledge the fact that you're drawing a penis, um, <laughs> and uh <laughs> and my other and then the, and then so that i know that got you a lot of attention yeah i mean just the fact that you were able to stand, stand and, and, and command attention and get last while actually teaching something was really yeah. rare for people and that's sort of a you know it's funny is i actually gave that talk yesterday um at a at, at o'keefe's mastermind um and I haven't, you know, I've really only, I really only did it the, the one time, um, I think it's a black label mess, but I hadn't, I'd never done it before. And, you know, I'm like, I'm going to just crack up. Like this, <laughs> I'm not just going to break up there. And I, I didn't break once, but, but sort of, I, I want to come back to that in a second, because the only reason that really exists in the, in the form it does is because of you, mm. um, which sort of comes back to when you asked, you know, was I always funny? Um, I think as a kid, I was funny. I liked making people laugh, but I wasn't the funniest kid. You know, there was, there's, there's the clown, there's, you know, I, I was mildly funny. You know, I was like a lukewarm, lukewarm laughter. Um, and I could do impressions and stuff from a young age. I used to do like Jim Carrey stuff and all that. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't like that was my thing. I, honestly, I was playing sports, you know, sports were really the, the main thing. And so... <laughs> And I think I got, I was funny as I was doing stand up. I started to get a bit funnier, I think. But then when the change happened, it was probably about a year, year and a half ago, I'd say. And what I started doing was every time people laughed around me, I asked why. Hmm. So I'd say, why are they laughing? Because most people, there's a joke or something, they, oh, that joke worked. I should use that again. Right. And even like a lot of comedians may not know exactly why someone, why people are laughing. They're just like, okay, that joke's good. And the common, you know, the common sort of why people laugh is, you know, there's an expectation and something that's not expected happens, right? Surprise. Yeah. And, and so there are a few key themes, but. Misdirection. And, By the way, I, I want to be clear that you didn't ask them why they laughed. No. <laughs> you, no, Because no, no. that, yeah. <laughs> that would why be are awkward. You laughing? Excuse me, <laughs> sir. Why are you laughing? Um, 
No, it's no, I literally, so like, seriously, with like a lot of discipline just started every time people would laugh, I go, yeah. why did they laugh? Yeah. And then, cause that's what I do. The same thing with copy and the same thing with, and with really everything I've learned is I deconstruct and go back and, and ask why and try and learn the principles and the strategies as a pro, as opposed to the tactics and techniques, right? Like a joke is a tactic yeah. or a technique, right? What's the underlying principle that makes some money? So honestly, that was it. Like if you start asking why, and I found like it got to the point where, and again, none of this is like, oh my God, look at me, I'm so funny. It's it's just sort of like, it ha- it, it you can develop it as a skill to a much deeper level where now I feel like it, I know when laughs are coming. I just, and some, it's, a lot of it's faster than my mind can move. I'll just say something mm-hmm. and then, you know, you get the laugh. And so asking that why has been like, because laughing is a biological need, mm-hmm. right? which is what's so weird about it. Like if you look, every human laughs, like Hitler laughed. You know, probably not about the same things we do. <laughs> but, but the, slightly darker bent. But, yeah. but the principles were the same, right? It was so. It's like why do humans have this thing where their their lips curl up and they go, <laughs> or they do that weird little nose laugh, you know, the, and then sometimes you snot rocket, and then you know, like <laughs> one of my deepest fears. I consider that an insult, by the way. When I when I go for the laugh and my and I get that from my wife, who's been listening to my my droll for you know. 30 years now but when when um uh well maybe not 30 years that makes me sound older than i am but if i get this if i get the that one i'm like you know what i'd much prefer no sound than that just just don't even pity me like that's the pity laugh and it's worse (laughs) it's It's like i acknowledge that you said something that was supposed to be amusing but was all I could muster. And they've heard so many too. And that's the problem is like, if you've got some stories that are sort of like, and I try not to just like repeat the same stuff, but I feel like over time, especially with the wife, you've got to just, she be like, if you tell this story one more time, I'm just going to, I'm going to lose it. And, but the people at the table may be like, this is the best story I've ever heard. Right. Right. She's just like, I can't. But so sort of to that, to what you had asked, the reason I say the why thing is first of all, I think you can develop comedy as a skill. Um, by understanding the underlying reasons why people laugh, but on top of that, um, like it's a it's a learning curve. There's no solution. So I had a great conversation with Ron Lynch just uh, this last Sunday that we can talk about in a bit. But what you did for that video is the first time I wrote that video, um, and I actually sort of like I think I'm, I actually like wrote it out. You know, and normally with videos I kind of just go and do something. I wrote it, and it was very easy to write. Because the analogies were, they made a ton of sense. They were really good analogies. It wasn't just like right. offensive. There's a difference in comedy where it's funny because it's offensive, right, or right, right. it's it's offensive, or it's it's very funny and just happens to be offensive. <laughs> right. Like that's the difference between like a Jim Norton who's just sort of like, you know, let me make him laugh with this stuff and it can be funny, and like Jim Jeffries who has a great joke that just happens to be really offensive. Right. Great. Great analogy. And so like when I drew the penis. <laughs> I'm known as either the toilet water guy or the penis guy, um, the, uh, which my mom is so proud of me for. Uh, and so when I first did the penis video, I love calling it that, especially out of context. It's just the worst. Um, you had seen it. And so we were about to hop on the call, you know, the, the group call, and you called me about five minutes before. And the original video is essentially, I think it's still actually on the site. I need to switch it out now that I have um, the other one. But basically, it was... Uh, this is his penis. And the reason I drew this is because now I've got your attention and attention is the most important thing you can have in marketing. Now I've got your attention. I'll show you how this applies to email marketing. Right. And I'm like, basically I had the, the few types I'm like, you want to give them just the tip just for a second. Just <laughs> feel. Not the- now, you you want to, you don't want to give them, you know, you got to get them, you know, you got to get them wanting it and you've got to get them all worked up and you can't just go straight in, you know, full on, you know, and stuff. And it was like, and it's, you know, it's, right. it's fun. Sure. Double and, entendre for days, but, but yeah, and but, it, but and funny it, and relevant. It, it, it lines up nicely. But, but that's the thing is so like I would have, and so I think the other now it was like, um, the two other types were, uh, uh, slutty marketing. So that was like when you just give it all away for free, right. And you just give it up too easy. Now they have no reason to buy anything. Right. right. They don't really respect the fact that you're going to chat, not like a hooker, but you know what I mean? Like for products online. <laughs> um, and then the other one was, uh, ouch, ouch, you're on my hair. <laughs> right. Which, which is something that we've all unfortunately experienced, um, at some point. Uh, and so 
and you know, which was that flinch response to like that abrasive marketing. That's just like, Ooh, ouch, ouch, you know, you're on my hair, like stop selling me so hard. And like, if you can feel the selling. Right. Um, and so sort of the mix was that, you know, that just the tip. And so, and so the funny thing is people remember it, you know, well, but I thought that was honestly like, you know, I thought it was the best thing I'd done. I'm like, I was proud of it. I was proud of my penis. You know, <laughs> I wanted to show the world my penis and Kevin calls and says, look, I'm not that impressed by your penis. <laughs> I've seen, and, seen and better. Seen I've, better. Seen, I've seen better penis and I'm not good at drawing, you know, and, <laughs> but, but you did say you, you said, um, you kind of called like you called me out and it, it was very nice of you to call me in advance. And you basically said, look, I, I think it was a bit almost over the top. I think, um, you know, it could be polarizing and not in that, not in exactly the way you want. Um, and I think mainly, you know, you could do something better. And the thing is, we only had a few minutes, so we had to get on the call. And that's kind of where you left me. Mm-hmm. And I, honestly, I was kind of, I was kind of annoyed. Mm-hmm. Like, and I don't get pissed about business stuff. Mm-hmm. And I don't really get offended by it. And I was kind of like, you know, can I swear? Can yeah, I say? Sure. I was like, kind of like, fuck you, Kevin. Yeah. Like, like what, you know, like I was proud, like I was actually, that was one of the, I cared about it. Like, you know, I normally I just sort of write stuff, whatever. And, uh, and you said, and, but you kind of left me, me hanging there. And so I was like, well, um, that sucks. <laughs> and so, um, and then what happened is then we talked, you know, I think about a week later and we went through and, and, and you sort of went through what you saw it more as in your head, which was this underhanded, not acknowledging the penis, um, you know, his just sort of like going about it that way. And honestly it was, I, so I went to the coffee shop the next day and I sat down with a little legal pad and I started trying to write it. And I've, it's funny, I've still got the notepad and I've got all these misshapen penises drawn <laughs> in this notepad. So I was trying to think, I'm like, okay, what, like a mushroom tip? And then I'm like a rocket and like, you know, trying to come up with, cause the analogies were genuinely easy and they made sense before. Right. It, like overt one. And so I'm like, fuck, this is hard. Not, I mean, no pun intended. <laughs> uh, sorry, I don't mean to be a dick. Yeah. No, no. Uh, so I, I want to make it clear what, and, and I don't want to interrupt, but I, I want to, if they're just hearing this, right, they don't have the, it's so my point to you was the real magic in this bit, I think, is the slowly revealing the joke, right? And yeah, I mean, it, I was essentially putting it in right away while talking about how you should slowly put it in. It, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, and I thought, I think, I th- you know, people are laughing at first at the shock value, but then they're admiring how cleverly you you sort of unpack it. But I f- knew that if you slowly revealed what was actually happening and the penis sort of emerged in the drawing, like halfway through, everybody's they it's like they get it and they're in on it with you and then it's it's twice as funny and then they feel like they're having it they're doing it with you rather than having it done to them <laughs> and uh and and i think it worked out that way and more consensual <laughs> it, <laughs> well, and that's and that's like that's the wisdom you know the wisdom of your comedic experience too is like i was almost like hitting them with the punchline and then sort of setting up other little jabs, yeah, right? Right. Instead of jab, 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 you know, then punchline. And it's really just like a build up, you know, they're they're really honestly it's very similar to, you know, what what the penis is all about. The and and so so the thing was is it was hard to write this thing. It was God, no, I can't get my mind out of the gutter. <laughs> Not that I ever have gotten it out of the gutter. But it was difficult. Like it was a genuine challenge. And I don't often feel real challenge when I sit down to write where it's like, I really have to think normally I just write very quickly. And I was like, this is, and it was, and, and I ended up coming up with what I think was the, at, at the time, really the best thing I've written and still, still up there. And it was, you know, very subtle. Right. And it was like, I draw the arc and then people are like, wait, there's no way, right. There's no way to draw a penis. Right. Right. This is a thing. And then I talk and then I'm like, and then I have the tip, but I kept, you know, deadpan. It's, it's funny with, you know, we're doing this today. Cause I, literally did it yesterday. Mm. Um, and I added some stuff. I think you'll quite enjoy some more punches. And then there's like little, you know, just like, uh, sort of puns and little jokes within there. Like, you know, the people who are the used car salesman type, are, you know, they're masters of baiting the hook. <laughs> uh, you've got to, you know, there are times you've got a master baiting as well. Like, you know, but, 
And so as we were talking about it after and, and so what's really cool about it, like, and this is, this is sort of the whole thing I think we're talking about with comedy and selling mm -hmm. is there's a difference between something just being funny and there's a difference between something that just sells and there's, you know, and then actually combining the two. Cause the only reason to use comedy to sell is either if it frames a sale better or if it creates engagement through a piece of content or video or writing that allows them to get to the point where it's sold. Right. And so, but the other thing is when you're actually teaching, emotion drives most learning. So I don't, people may not remember my name. They may not remember anything about me, but they remember just the tip. And some of the people who've like been like, Oh man, I was writing like, you know, I can't remember your name. He's like, what does your name mean? I'm like, yeah. and he's like, Oh, he's like, I was writing this thing the other day. And I was like, what would just the tip be for this? Like, you know, and, and they remember. And so it actually, yeah. it's a, and then also like with, if you speak at an event or anything, it's an instant level of you oh, know, yeah. people can't like, believe it. If you get a genuine laugh or two, like they're just not expecting it, right? It's it's magic. It's it's all, it, that, and that's the difference, right? You've talked, you know, I've talked about this between stand up. The goal is laughs, right? You're not there to be a philosopher right, or to right. do other things. And so, when you can teach good content and you can get people to laugh, yeah, top of that, it's just you know you're layering on um, just a lot of value. It's all bonus, right? And it right. just but it really like I didn't realize how much it helps with the actual learning side of it and helping people. Yeah, because like, well, they're letting their guard down, and there's no quicker way to get somebody's attention than to get them laughing. Because again, they don't expect it. Talk about misdirection, right? And they're gonna hang on your every word more because the, you there's been a, there's a silent agreement now that there's there's funny to come. And if they pay attention, they're going to be greatly rewarded for it, right? Rather than just check it out and check out and start, you know, scrolling through their Facebook. Well, and, and so that was something like in person, just sort of like to tie that up is there were like 40 people in the room. And a guy had spoken earlier in the day, he was a really smart guy, and nobody was paying attention. Mm. I wasn't paying attention. Everybody had their camera or their, uh, you know, their computer out. They had their laptop on the desk or at least on their phone. And, mm -hmm. and it was really smart, but it just wasn't engaging. Mm -hmm. And he, you know, and that's the difference between having good content and not being able to entertain. And so my goal, so when I went up and like, I hadn't, this is honestly, I think it was my first time actually speaking, like not, but having done stand up, and you know, only like nine or 10 times, but there's nothing tougher than that. Yeah. <laughs> like it's, you know, it's, it's scary as shit. So it's, and it's just the dumbest thing you can do. Who who decides I'm going to go <laughs> give myself the opportunity to publicly fail in front of a group <laughs> of strangers or tell them about the time I was mistaken for a girl or <laughs> about, you know, my mum walking in or what, you know, like you're like, let me go tell the story I've told no one to a group of people who've never met me. <laughs> Risk them just going, you are the least funny human ever. <laughs> <laughs> it's our reward for your uh, transparency is rejection. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah, just public, and you have to public. It's like writing. At least you can fail in your underwear and your fucking, you know, bedroom. Like, or yeah, potentially go back and edit the really dumb part the next yeah, day or exactly. something. It's nothing in real time. Well, uh, and so, well, just, just yeah. real quick, what I said to them is just like what you said. I said, look, let me be a dick for a second. If and I just said, can you guys put away your cameras? Or I don't know. I keep saying cameras. Put pull your cameras out. Um, <laughs> put your you know put your laptops away. Put your phones away, and just give me five minutes. If in five minutes you aren't fully engaged with what I'm saying, mm. pull out your laptop. Pull out your phone. I haven't done my job. Very cool. And I just said that to lead off because I was like, if and I think that's fair. I think if somebody gives you five minutes and you're boring, then they don't. You know, they shouldn't have to listen to you. Yeah, I like that. All right, steal that next time. I like that a lot. Uh, and then seven minutes later, they were all had their heads down. But that didn't matter because you were bold enough to uh, to command their attention in the beginning. They were so bored. <laughs> so let's talk about let's talk about, you know, practicing in public, because then, you know, in this world today, this is why I feel for stand ups uh, now is that they, they hardly get a chance to go work out anywhere. Right. Um, everybody's got a cell phone, you know, and now with live video streaming, uh, if you're Chris Rock or Louis CK or Amy Schumer, anybody trying to work out some new material at an, you know, uh, lesser known club on a Wednesday night, some douchebag in the third row is probably streaming it live on Facebook while you, while you do it. Right. 
And but in your case, in sort of in my case, we want to use that tool because that's sort of that's our audience, right? And so, in uh, so for you, I'm I'm curious because I've watched you evolve comedically on Facebook as well, and uh, I'm a little more calculated where I'll I'll do something in a video, and it's usually born of spontaneity, but then I'll. I'll watch it back before I post it to kind of see if, if I'm thinking it's resonating. Sometimes I'm right and sometimes I'm wrong in both directions. You, you're you pretty quick to flip on Facebook Live and just roll with it and see what happens. And uh, y- you struck gold recently with a parody that is, is gone pretty, pretty huge in our industry at least. I mean, you know, 14,000 views, 84 shares. That's a lot of shares, man. <laughs> Uh, so t- tell us about that video and and what was behind it. Yeah, and you know it's kind of interesting about the shares there. Um, and you know we can stuff about virality, but like uh, I think quite a few people actually were also private messaging it to people, mm. um, which you know doesn't go into the shares count because which which was what was kind of cool about something like that where you know it's it's lie topes, um, and so you know sort of the, there's obviously a joke within the name there. Um, but what was interesting about it is people were, uh, willing to share something that could have been controversial in a way. And some, you know, I've got friends who know him, mm-hmm. you know, well, I'm quite certain I'll be meeting him at some point reasonably soon, just within the circles and stuff. And, mm-hmm. um, and people, willing to sh- and then it opened up some dialogues of people that like some very high level, you know, marketers and copywriters of people who are like, man, this, you know, like they really identify with people are annoyed. Right. And yeah, so if you yeah. sort of call out the truth about something, you get people. The cool thing is you attract people into your life that feel the same way you do about honesty and about, you know, sort of just being that, you know, being sort of no bullshit. And so um, but the thing with with that video and, and something that you pointed out after is, you know, slow down on the quantity. Yeah. yeah. Right. And, and which was insanely valuable. And it was sort of the feeling I had as well. And but you said a sentence that really stood out to me after I did it, which was, you know, my thought is, okay, I've got this wave, let's ride it, right? Let's get some content, get more out there. Like, cause I can do them every day. I can do plenty of them, sure. but that doesn't mean that they're great. And what you said is the people are hungry. They're waiting. They'll, they want it. They'll wait for whatever. Right. They, they're hungry. And that was like, huh? Okay. So I don't have to try and just, ride the wave and the timing, I can, you know, take my time, create a bit more quality and if anything, build up more suspense, um, to do another one and have that one, you know, be go wider and and further. And, and there's nothing, it's not selling anything or doing anything. Um, but, uh, yeah, because you you don't want to go from like a compliment complimented you up front is that, you know, people quickly realize, wow, this guy's really funny but also there's layers to this cat. Then they'll see you five minutes later over in the corner having a deep discussion with somebody, right? And they'll be like, okay, this guy's just not a clown. And then they'll talk to you in different contexts and you're not desperate for the laugh. And so it's the same sort of thing in this weird world of Facebook where it feels like our only job is to get attention and to get as many eyeballs as we can and likes and shares and all and, and comments. But I think it's the same kind of thing where the cooler people uh, are going to notice if you can keep it up. And the only way to keep it up is to be a little calculated about it. And I notice I want to – and just to give some context if people are listening and don't know what, what Lytopism is, it's a parody. And this is something you've done a lot of and it's, it's always really funny. You create these characters um, who are – you know, loosely based on somebody we might know or, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, an amalgamation of several people. Like you, you've had, you know, motivational speakers and you've got the guy, the, the, the coach who coaches coaches how to coach coaches. And that one went viral after. <laughs> after this, like right. Lopez. And that, that video is like eight, ten videos. That, you know, people were going through all my videos. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. So, so that was the other thing is there was already a backlog of, of things for, for them to discover, right? And so yeah. this was, uh, you know, Ly Topez based on probably the most viral guy. Even my kids know who this guy is for some reason. You know, it's weird. 
Uh, he shot a video of him and his Lamborghini and talked about books and all this. Anyway, uh, this is the first time you've gone sort of more directly at one person, right? Than, yeah. Than an industry or, you know, uh, a mix of characters. And again, did you give second thought to that at all? Or, or were you waiting to sort of parody this guy or, or was it totally spontaneous in the moment? No, it was. So I'd actually been doing them for a few days before that. Oh, OK. Uh, but just little ones. So I'll, I'll probably actually put those together because sort of like you said, I didn't want to just put out each one. Yeah. But there are funny bits within each one, like things like, what's up? I'm like Topaz. I'm here in my wine cave. <laughs> You know, like, just like I was in ridiculous, you know, we're going to, we're at this chateau in France, which I know how douchey that sounds, but it, like, it's just what it was. Can't help it. That's where you were, right? Yeah. And then, yeah. And so like, there's things like, you know, I'd just be like, you know, I'm here at my banquet hall, you know, and we're having, you know, lunch out on the veranda, you know, this is my table. Like, it's a little small and just like, <laughs> so there are like clips of, you know, sort of funny stuff within, but, um, it wasn't so, ca honestly, uh, Scott Ruick, like challenge, he like, thank, I need that push from people I respect, right? And that goes back to what you said about that video, mm -hmm. is that I had that gut reaction that was sort of like, fuck you, Kevin. Mm -hmm. And then since then, anytime somebody's challenging me, especially with the comedic stuff, I get really excited because I know that it's meant out of, from the bottom of your heart, out of like wanting to, you know, see the best. And also I think you guys see more in me than I see in myself at times, like where like you, you're thinking further down the road and thinking long term, and, and so getting excited about, you know, getting people that challenge you. Cause most people, especially if you have sort of a dominant personality, like, you know, the people don't tend to challenge you. Right, and so, right. but you need it. Like you, you know, and you need to surround yourself with people that are willing to say, Hey dude, you can do fucking better. That wasn't that good. Or, or just like to be on that being honest, that it's no criticism. It's just, so he, he kind of just pushed me. He's like, you got to do it. And so the funny thing is, is I waited, we were literally getting in the bus to go back to Paris, like from Le Mans or whatever, where that's, you know, where we were. And I recorded that like last, like I finally did the full one that I, you know, and that was the library. That was like this, the whole punchline with that, right. Is in my library is where I lie about all the books I read. Um, and so the, uh, I had like, you know, going after one individual person wasn't necessarily, it wasn't like an idea of, of something. And, and I've now thought about that since. Mm -hmm. And it's a tough line. And this is something that I'm sure we'll talk about moving forward because there's stuff like, you know, I, I'm, I actually do like Tony Robbins quite a lot. I've been to his stuff and, you know, I think he's great. But I'm like, man, Phony Bobbins is just a great name. <laughs> And then I'm like, shit, like, you know, I, and so then it's like turn the line of like where, you know, and so it'll be an interesting sort of thing. But, but I will say one thing, because people are you worried about people saying, you know, like finding, like getting angry or whatever. And honestly, I'm, I'm not. And yeah. like, because frankly, I'm sure I'll meet him. If he, if, if Ty were to be like, hey man, that was really funny. I'd be like, damn, you're way cooler than expected. If he's not, no, and I, I don't want to get into depth with that now. But <laughs> right, like, right. But the, uh, if, if I get blacklisted out of the internet marketing world, the people that it, it doesn't matter to me because I, you know, first of all, I make pretty much all my money outside of it, yeah. you know, doing other stuff. And, and I just care about the truth. You know, I don't like people getting screwed over. And so if, if I can call somebody out and it helps somebody not get fleeced. Great. Yeah. I, I think, I, I think that's the, the thing with you is that I don't sense anger behind it. You know, I think you're, you're just, a naturally funny guy, you, your mind goes to satire and parody sort of just by nature. And it, to me, that makes it even funnier if one of your quote unquote victims were to get really pissed about it. <laughs> it would just make it 10 times funnier to me because they, they just don't get you. There's no way they could meet you and stay pissed, I don't think, you know? Well, unless they aren't, you know, that, that would sort of prove... <laughs> Yeah, they're, they're just kind of a douche, right? Yeah, so I, I don't know. That To me, that makes it twice as powerful. And the other thing, I always say this about, like, comedians have it, you, you know, the only way to defend yourself against attack is to not take yourself too damn seriously, right? Like, yeah. like you know, Jack Black. Can you imagine Jack Black? Jack Black exposed on, you know, it, it's not going to happen, you know, unless he did something like really vulgar, or hurt somebody. But otherwise, he'd be the, like the first guy to joke about it or any any comic, Amy Schumer. Like, what's what are you going to say about Amy Schumer that she wouldn't say first? Right. And that I mean, that's another one of the areas where comedy is such a unique 
tool is like, you know, I used to get, if you get made fun of in high school or in, you know, like you should probably preface this, uh, this podcast, by the way, with I'm telling them I'm half English and half American, which means everyone thinks I'm Australian <laughs> because otherwise they're going to be just going, where is this guy from? That's um, true. Right. Which I actually, that is how I open up when I talk because I, I otherwise they're just going to be sitting there going, I don't know where he's from and I can't pay attention. <laughs> um, but, uh, it's, it's but, a riddle to be solved and then and they're just you know confused all the time but yeah. basically um i mean of course i've completely lost my train of thought this is why you don't have the messages thing on your apple right. open it's so annoying um, more important may be happening uh, <laughs> um, we we're talking about you know the best defense is uh is oh yeah not taking and, and so you know as a kid like with my accent like because oh you've got a you got a you got a fake accent bro and i'm like shut up it's not fake <laughs> You know, and I'd get pissed because that's one thing nobody understands. If you say somebody's got a fake accent and that's how they talk every day, you're essentially saying that fundamentally that person is waking up and deciding to lie to the world every day, <laughs> <laughs> which I'm too lazy to do. But but I learned then if as I go, I'm like, oh, if I just go, oh, yeah, totally fake practice 15 minutes in the morning, 15 minutes at night, you know, and that's why I've chosen this weird quasi Australian accent, because why would I do a normal English one if I was going to fake it? Um, but but that. And somebody, you know, when we were at this chateau thing, there's like a burlesque dance and there's, I get put on stage in handcuffs, which I shouldn't really tell the story, but this kind of proves your point. <laughs> They're like, we've got pictures, we can blackmail you. I'm like, how can you blackmail somebody without shame? Yeah. Post it on Facebook. I don't care. What, <laughs> like what weapon, you know, if, if you can laugh and, and joke and, and, you know, have a good time, there's not a lot that can really... You, know, you you choose to take a few things seriously in life. You, you 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 know you pick your three things maybe that you care about, and if if something's not one of those three things, you just relax. Everybody treats everything with the same like amount of anger and and importance, and right, it's like right. most stuff just isn't that important. Yeah, great great point. <laughs> Hey, it's Kev here. We're about to get to the essential question of the show. But first, if you'd like to go deeper into all the marketing strategies that the top pros are using to really move the needle on their sales, then I invite you to come join us on the inside of Copy Chief. Go to copychief.com forward slash join, J-O-I-N, and uh, see a special offer for uh, you to come check it out. And what you'll do in there is you could uh, enjoy one of the trainings. We've got 12 different trainings on how to improve your copy. Uh, we also have uh, an invitation to you to post up your copy and get reviews, friendly, happy, helpful reviews from all the cool copywriting pros hanging out in Copy Chief. So it's a great community. You really love it. Tons of valuable information. We want to help you sell better. Come join us at copychief.com forward slash join. All right. So I'm going to get to the essential question because there's another great lesson here. Um, and so let's just jump into it. Uh, Ian Stanley. Oh, and by the way, I, I meant to give out your, your URL. Let me do that first. If people want to connect with you, find out... Uh, all the stuff you're doing. And by the way, we haven't even talked about the fact that you, you're highly regarded, highly accomplished email copywriter amongst your other copywriting. Uh, you have a great course called 8020 email copy copywriting, but people, if you want to get in Ian's world, first of all, looking, look him up on Facebook, um, and go to standupconversions.com is where to find Ian standupconversions.com. Okay, so Ian Stanley, what is the one thing you've done in your marketing that has produced the most surprising results? Um, so this is the one question I was prepared for, right? Yes, sir. So uh, I would say it uh, it was the toilet water video, um, and I'll explain. I can explain that in a second. But the the reason that it's the most surprising probably isn't the traditional sort of surprise, like, oh man, it, it, oh, it crushed it, mm -hmm. you know, I'm just raking in cash. Um, it was that the stuff that has happened because of that offline mm -hmm. and, um, primarily the connections. So toilet water videos essentially, you know, starts out like jackass and I'll be making a new one soon, which, uh, I'm sure hopefully you'll see as I, hope to get on to, well, I plan on getting onto some talk shows after doing the stupid stuff I plan on doing. 
Um, but uh, the bass guy just said, I'm in and I'm about to drink toilet water. You know, and then I, I go and it's, uh, you know, you can actually probably still find the video or hopefully it'll be a new one by the time this is published. But um, what it was is what I think of as undeniable proof. Most people think about proof and they create what I call deniable proof. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I'm naturally very naive. Um, so I just believe things. I just assume people are telling the truth because that's what I thought people were like. <laughs> yeah. Um, not the case. But so when I create these videos, I think of it um, almost like uh, watching a magician, right? And you're trying to figure out how they're doing the trick, hmm. right? And so if you like, in, so if you look at somebody like David Blaine, right? There's one in his Street Magic where um, he's sitting there with Ricky Gervais, and and he's got this needle, and it looks like he's putting his ne- this needle through his bicep, right, through his arm, and Ricky's like, "What are you on about? What are you doing? Stop it!" Well, stop that's that oh and you know he's just freaking out and and then you just realize you're like what is the trick here and they're like no he's just putting a fucking needle through his arm <laughs> it's not a magic trick <laughs> right right it's just that's what he's doing and so you think of it from that perspective of like how could and, and everybody's got that one douchey friend who thinks everything's fake yeah so think about them sitting there watching how could they think this is fake how could they right. and so that was sort of the lens i took and i thought the water video honestly i thought it was comedy um, and then I realized, and so this was the big sort of connection from it that then spurred a lot of other things was, um, the video went around, you know, we got like 400,000 views in the first couple of days. And then it's something with the manufacturer, they're like, take it down long story. But basically, um, this guy, Ron Lynch, who's a legend within, you know, direct response. And he well, did all- I just want to give a little bit of context. So you the product was a water filter. Right, and you literally uh, had a camera follow you into a public men's room, and you filled the uh, a glass with uh, toilet water out of straight out of the toilet, and you poured that water through the filter, and then you drank it. Yeah, and you don't know that there's a filter until I've gotten to the back to the sink after filling the glass. Like everything was pretty. We only, it took one, it was one take, you know, and it was one clean shot and you can never let the pitcher out of, or the, the water out of sight. And there are little things like, you know, if you watch it, you'll see like I pull off the lid of the pitcher to make sure there's nothing hidden in there. It's undeniable. And so when people watch the video, actually, there were comments to be like, oh, he drank out of the same glasses before. And somebody's like, no, he didn't. You can see that's behind him and people like defending. Right, right. For me. And so, so yeah, the, and that was part of it. Just like, you know, if you, that's part of the punchline, right? That's where sales is so similar to comedy. If I have a pitcher in my hand and I go, I'm about to drink toilet water and I'm going to filter it through this, you go, I don't okay. You know, and it's still, people are still like, the, obviously it's still shock when you see putting it through a filter and still drinking toilet water. But like, yeah. it's building up to that punchline and that curiosity and keeping that loop open. So in your mind, this is, this is comedy, uh, but obviously with a, with a point to, you know, show people this is how much confidence I have in this water. Yeah. It's the ultimate Billy Mays sort of, you know, put it to the test. Yeah. And uh, it worked really well for sales. Yeah. Um, and so, but, but so I get, um, you know, a call from uh, somebody connected to Ron Lynch, right. And they said he did OxyClean, he did, you know, Foreman Grill and, uh, GoPro and everything that you know, so many of the direct you know, yeah, legend- legendary marketer, uh, publicist, and uh, yeah, and one of the greatest people on the planet, yeah, yeah, fantastic guy, just brilliant and humble, you know, great guy. And so, so I get this call and I'm talking to, and I'm like on the phone with him, and I'm like, how the hell am I on the phone with this guy? Like, how has this happened? He is so far above my pay grade, he's so much smarter than and he, he is genuinely one of the smartest human beings I've ever met. I mean, he just blows holes in your brains and make you makes you pick up the pieces. Um, but, uh, you know, we're talking, we end up, he lives in Austin. So we end up, you know, meeting up and he's now become one of my closest friends and, and mentors. And, you know, I was saying to you, you and you and Ron sort of fall into the same category of, of mentor for me because you guys understand the comedy side and you really see the long term of it. Right. And not the easy laugh and, and, and stuff like that. And so, but what happened, you know, that, that was Ron. And then since then, um, what I've found is, you know, a lot of people, especially a lot of marketers have seen this video and it's, you know, I thought I was like, oh yeah, it's probably a pretty good video. I, you know, I wasn't like, oh, this is some piece. And then when Ron is like, that was one of the best videos I've seen, you know, you're like, you know, sort of, you know, just shell shocked. 
but it's created a ton of just these little connections that I never could have expected where one of the biggest, and it's the same thing with the Lai Topaz video, to be honest, is, you know, and I think this happens, especially with a lot of copywriters. And like you said, I, I don't really call myself a copywriter so much anymore, yeah. but the, just cause it can pigeonhole a bit, but yeah. like a lot of copywriters are still chasing, right? And they're chasing clients and stuff. And, and sometimes it's just cause maybe you're not that good yet, which is okay. Um, and sometimes it's because you haven't, Sometimes you got to say how good you are, which is tough because it seems arrogant. Or you have to try and get other people to say how good you are without, you know, you have to be able to ask. Yeah. Uh, but the the other thing, so it's it's created a chase, right? Where I'm not chasing, people are sort of coming to me, and and you know, with the Lightopas one, like even on the comments and and some of the private messages and stuff I got, and some of the people who shared it, these are like really high level marketers and you know, some of them, you know, who I, who I don't know at all. And now suddenly there's this connection of, Oh, Hey man, that was like a great video. I also got some really weird messages, like some girl and Austin was like, Hey, I live in Austin. I saw your video. Um, we should get a coffee sometime when you get back. And I was like, Oh, uh, I looked <laughs> at it. You have groupies. She wasn't now. quite up. She wasn't quite up to the standard. Um, <laughs> but, but you know, the, uh, so, I mean, I think that's one of the biggest things is obviously not everybody's going to drink toilet water or, you know, do parodies, but that having like whatever your one thing is, whatever your unique skill that like, what, what are you willing to do that nobody else is willing to do? And what can you do that no one else can replicate? I focused for a while on doing things that other people could replicate because I wanted to teach them. So like, oh, I want to do marketing that other people can do too, because, you know, I want to help people learn marketing. And then I was like, well, what can I do that no one can do? How, you know, it's better to be different than it is to be better, and it's easier mainly. Um, and so that's what's been interesting is now even like going to a mastermind or something, people, you know, have seen that video, and then there's this different feeling, oh, hey, I mean, you know, Ian, good to meet you. And they'll come up, like, dude, I saw your video, whatever, like. Yeah, there's that instant, well, there's a celebrity factor to it. That, that This is one of the amazing things about being an entrepreneur, a marketer in, in this day and age. Two things that uh, still amaze me. One is that a book still gives you instant credibility. If somebody can go on Amazon and see your name on a book, they just go, wow, you wrote a book? Uh, it, 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 so that has, I would just would have thought that would have gone away by now because <laughs> everybody's written a damn book. But it still means something to write a book and uh, it should and it does. The other thing is, you know, it is easy as it is to get, to get a video out into the world. Like Ty Lopez is you walking around. It's a selfie video. It's about, you know, a couple of minutes long. And like you said, you know, people you otherwise would have never reached yet are seeing this and they want to talk to you. They, they want to say, oh, yeah, I know Ian. I'm having, I'm having lunch with Ian next week. You know, it's because it's just instant celebrity. And so I don't think that cheapens it. I don't think the fact that it's easy to write a book makes it less impressive to have written a book. And I don't think the fact that it's easy to get a lot of attention on video make, gives it less credence. It's all what's behind it, right? Like you say, like we both say a lot, the best thing somebody can pay you first is attention, but it's all what you do with it from there. And you know, all you've done is, is impressed, dude. You know, I mean, um, we could do a whole nother episode on just your personal journey, the work you've done on yourself. I mean, four, just four months ago, you and I were having very different conversations <laughs> Yeah, and, and you were very perplexed personally with the situation. And it's, it's hard to believe it's only been three months since you made a big decision and, and have been on this. You just got back from a, a trip around the world, essentially, uh, and so I'm going to end here because I, I, I want to leave, I want to leave people wanting more. And, uh, I definitely want to do a part two with you if you'll agree to that. I would love to, I'm talking to you is one of my favorite things. And I, I don't say that lightly. So I, I, I consider that a privilege, my friend. Um, and so thanks for doing this. I, I'm going to link to all the videos. If you can find the toilet water video, any link to it, that'd be great. I love that. This is the, <laughs> well, we'll link the toilet water video. We'll link the penis video. <laughs> yeah. It sounds very clean. <laughs> well, hopefully I'll have the new, uh, the new toilet water video for the new company, which will be, fixed f-i-x-t water so okay um, 
then it'll be uh, I won't be promoting something else. <laughs> but, yeah, right. Good point. All right. So th that's the whole another discussion is now that you're like a, you know, big kid business owner here. Uh, it's getting serious. So uh, adulting, adulting. All right, Ian. Thanks for doing this, brother. Uh, appreciate you. And um, thank you, man. Yeah, we'll be talking real soon. Cheers, man. Hey, thanks again for listening to the Truth About Marketing podcast. If you like this show and you think other people would like this show, the best way to spread the word is by reviewing and rating the show in iTunes. Just log in, click review, leave a big old fat five-star review, and let everybody know that you dig the show so that they can dig it too. To get all the links and resources we mentioned on today's episode, please go to copychief.com forward slash TAM, as in truth about marketing. And if you'd like to uh, learn more about how you can improve your sales copy with uh, templates, formulas, coaching, feedback, or hiring a pro, do all that on the inside of the members area of copychief.com. And I will look for you there. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.